Good morning, church. So the passage for, to- passage for today is 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 to 25. All right. So pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. For the person who speaks in a tongue is not speaking to people, but to God, since no one understands him. He speaks mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the person who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. The person who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. I wish all of you spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesied. The person who prophesies is greater than the person who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be built up. So now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you whether revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Even lifeless instruments that produce sounds, whether flute or harp, if they don't make a distinction in the notes, how will what is played on the flute or harp be recognised? In fact, if the bugle makes an unclear sound, who will prepare for battle? In the same way, unless you use your tongue for intelligible speech, how will what is spoken be known? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different kinds of languages in the world. None is without meaning. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker will be a foreigner to me. So also you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek to excel in building up the church. Therefore, the person who speaks in a tongue should pray that he can interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What then? Will I pray with the spirit, and will I also pray with my understanding? I will sing praise with the spirit, and I will also sing praise with my understanding. Otherwise, if you praise with the Spirit, how will the outsider say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying? For you may very well be giving thanks, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding in order to teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your thinking, but be infants in regard to evil and adult in your thinking. It is written in the law. I will speak to this people by people of other tongues and by the lips of foreigners, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Speaking in tongues then is intended as a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for believers. If if therefore... The whole church assembles together and all are speaking in tongues and people who are outsiders or unbelievers come in. Will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all are prophesying and some unbeliever or outsider comes in, he is convicted by all and is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart will be revealed and as a result, he will fall face down and worship God, proclaiming God is really among you. I don't know if you know, but when I um, was watching online the church service before I moved here, oh, that's loud. I actually downloaded uh, one of the songs uh, that one of your youth bands sung, um, and to me, it moved me more than the original. When I found the original, I'd never heard it before, and. I don't know if you noticed, but everyone wanted to stay standing in that last song. It was really beautiful. I just want to affirm that in you guys. Um, and Jeff, just it's quite humbling right now to preach when I feel like uh, the Lord is moving so well uh, with his people. So I just appreciate that. There's a word, uh, blessing, and sometimes in the Bible what it means is to strengthen the arm of someone else. And um, it's that idea of kind of when you need to lift something heavy or something like that and you need to call on someone to come alongside you and, and help, help with the load or whatever that might be. And I just also wanted to acknowledge uh, Hillcrest Christian School uh, for coming along, and your brothers and sisters out at Sherwood. Uh, you guys have been such a blessing, and I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. This morning we're in Acts chapter 14, 
And what we're going to be doing this morning is I'm not going to be relaying down a foundation on prophecy and tongues and spiritual gifts, uh, nor am I going to re-go over love that 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 was on about. Instead, what we're going to look at is what Paul speaks about is the logistics of how the spiritual gifts are to be working inside the corporate worship of the, of the saints. So what we need to drill into our heads before we read this is that Paul is speaking about when the Christian brothers and sisters gather together to worship the Lord and to hear from the Lord, he gives some direction on how to use the spiritual gifts for the edification or building up of the body. The word edification just means to, to build up, to build up. Uh, The points, I'm going to run through them from 1 to 5, 6 to 12, 13 to 20, 21 to 25. If you you have a Bible, crack it open. If you need a Bible, we got some pew Bibles. They're behind the the sound desk. Uh, If you get your phone, flick it out. But we're going to just run through this and we're going to look at what Paul is speaking about. Uh, But from 1 to 5, we're going to look at how our, our spiritual gifts or the gifts in worship, they should encourage one another. It should be what they do. Uh, Number two, our gifts in worship should bring unity in Christ, 6 to 12. Our gifts in worship should bring clarity to the Lord, who He is, what He's done, and our gifts in worship should bring glory to God. So we start in 1 to 5 to look at our gifts in worship should encourage one another. So Paul says, pursue love, that's off the back of 1 Corinthians 13, and then he says, and desire spiritual gifts and especially that you may prophesy. So he says, church, I want you to do three things. I want you to pursue love for one another. We already know that. I go back there. Desire spiritual gifts. Again, looked at that last week. And especially that you may prophesy. So he holds one up particularly, not at the uh, extent to diminish the others because they're all from the Lord, but he holds this one up for a purpose. And we find that purpose in verse 2 when he says, for the person who speaks in a tongue, is not speaking to people, but to God. Since no one understands him, he speaks mysteries in the Spirit. So directly after saying, hey, look, what you should, what you should value, what you should seek to have in church is prophecy, then he goes on to talk about the limitations that tongue-talking has. And it's worth noting that Paul, as we saw in 1 Corinthians, uh, sorry, in chapter 13, verse 1, he says, if I speak in human or angelic tongues... So we don't know whether he's talking about the foreign tongue, which Paul could speak in, or he's talking about an angelic tongue. But it doesn't matter either way. If the tongue is left uninterpreted in the church setting, it's not useful and therefore should be withheld. And what we should excel in is to speak in prophetic word. And he shows why prophecy is better. He says tongue talking is spiritual conversation it's from the Holy Spirit and it's, and it's speaking, it's directed to God. So the person is speaking to the Lord. But everyone else doesn't know what's going on and neither does the speaker know what's going on intellectually. But when the prophetic word happens, when the Holy Spirit manifests in the prophetic word, when the person speaks, they speak the words of the Lord for the people. So now everyone understands and now everyone knows And this is why he says, this is the one you should look for. Tongues build up the individual, he says, but prophetic word builds up everyone. And then Paul lists in verse 3, on the other hand, he says, the person who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, their encouragement, and their consultation. So this is the end goal of the prophetic word. That it strengthens, that it encourages, and that it consoles. Again, that word for strengthen is to build up. It builds up the church. Now, building up is imagery, isn't it? What are we building up? Well, we're building up the body of Christ. There's going to be, uh, come a prophetic word in a little bit from Paul in Isaiah, and it says that Jesus is the cornerstone. He's, he's the foundation. He's what's to be built on. So when someone prophesies, what it should do is it should strengthen the people of God on Christ, according to His Word. When Jesus talks about building, if you want to build something in your life that has meaning, that has value, that's going to last for eternity, build on a solid foundation, a rock, not on sand. What is the foundation? He says, anyone who believes and trusts in my word and does what I say, they will have a sure foundation. 
So the prophetic word encourages that it strengthens his people on his word. It encourages, that's the second one, what for? It encourages them to act in faith. It encourages them to greater loyalty and faithfulness to the Lord. And thirdly, it consoles. People are grieving, people in loss, people wondering, where is the Lord? It brings counsel, it brings healing. The prophetic word helps. So this is the end goal of prophecy in verse 3. The person who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, as we just saw, but the one who prophesied builds up the church. And then in verse 5 he says, I wish that all of you spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesied. The person who prophesies is greater than the person who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so the church may be built up. So Paul's, he's got no problem with tongues. I think, you know, again, I talked about this last week, so I don't need to go into it, but people can get all funny about it. Paul's saying, look, tongues are fantastic. They're great. We should speak in them. They are a gift. However, the deep desire that I have for you, church, is that you can prophesy because it, it does something for the other. And just coming out of 1 Corinthians 13, we can see why that's the priority. Love, it doesn't seek self. It's not just about self. It's about the other, the betterment of the other. Our gifts in worship should be motivated to encourage, as foundational, to encourage the other person. And we'll get more into that as we go along. So how does it encourage? We go now into point two from 6 to 12. It should bring unity in Christ. When, when the gifts are at work of the Holy Spirit, it should be unity in Christ for the brothers and sisters. So Paul now creates a scenario in verse 6. He says, So now, brothers and sisters, if I came to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you with revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? It's pretty much like going to school and the, and the teacher sits there and he goes, Hey, look, I'm going to uh, teach you some world history. And then just starts smashing out world history in Spanish. What would be the point of the class? Nothing. You, you arrive for no reason whatsoever. And he says, so if I came to you and I decided I'm going to come teach you and I just started talking in a foreign language or started speaking in the angelic tongue, what would be the point of my speech? Nothing. You'd receive no revelation. You'd receive no knowledge. Revelation comes from prophetic word. Knowledge comes from teaching. And then he continues and he says, even lifeless instruments, so he brings up another illustration for us, even lifeless instruments that produce sounds, whether flute or harp, if they don't make a distinction in the notes, how will what is played on the flute or harp be recognized? You know, I watch Reuben and God sent his son, I know the notes. I know the distinction in the notes. So when he plays it, I know what's going on. If you got me to tinker on it in communion, you wouldn't know because I don't know what I'm doing. It wouldn't make any sense. There'd be nothing to enjoy. But then Paul continues on and he talks about the bugle <clears throat> in verse 8. In fact, if the bugle makes an unclear sound, <clears throat> who will prepare for battle? <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the trumpet or the bugle was used for the soldiers. Battle formations, when to get ready, what to do. But if it's not distinct, if they can't hear what's going on, can't do anything. It's nonsense to their ears and they can't get ready for what's happening. And Paul says all this in illustrative form to say in verse 9, <clears throat> in the same way, unless you use your tongue for intelligible speech, how will what is spoken be known? What's the point? For you will be speaking into the air. One of the biggest disconnects that I think churches can get actually is, is high language. Because it's not saying, hey, speak intelligently. High language. Intelligible. So that people can understand. I think pastors can get caught up speaking Christological. But sometimes you're like, but what does it even mean? You're speaking in a foreign tongue almost to me. The idea is that we speak in such a way that we know the other person can understand what's going on. Because it's about them, it's not about us. But he says, how will the other person, uh, how will what is spoken be known? 
for you'll be speaking into the air. And I think there was a great problem here in Corinth. There was a spiritual power, a spiritual dynamic that people wanted to have or invest into. Because he says, look, when people speak by the Holy Spirit in the tongue, they are speaking to God. That's legitimate. I think when people are speaking the tongue, yet it's not manifest by the Holy Spirit, it's just in the air. It's not going to the Lord, it's not doing anything. And so we need to be mindful of that. And he says in turn, there are doubtless many different kinds of languages in the world. None is without meaning. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I'll be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. You know, I love talking with Elijah and uh, I just have to realize that there's a language barrier there that I don't get. And yesterday we were sitting in my office and he wanted to talk to me about some theological concepts. And so there I am on Google, typing into Google Translate. Because I'm trying to understand him and he's trying to understand me and there's just a barrier there. But we're trying to find a common means in which we can communicate. And Paul's saying, if you're just going to talk in tongues, you're, you're posing yourself as a foreigner to the other person. They can't get anything out of that communication. There's no relationship. It makes you feel distant, actually, from the Lord and from one another. I think there's a great humor also in tongue talking. Like I said, I think there was a spiritual kind of atmosphere going on in Corinth, or not, I think there was. They wanted to be very zealous for the gifts, Paul says. But in their, in their wanting to be like super spiritual, they actually start going against the whole point really of tongue talking. If you know your, your story in Genesis, when it gets to the, the Tower of Babel, when all humans all over the earth, they all speak the same language. And in their unity that they share in the language, they're really good at coordinating. They can get a lot done. And so they all start to think, why don't we build our way up to God? So they start building the tower and the Lord kind of like in his chariot comes coming past in the heavenlies and he's like, oh, look what they're doing. This is evil. And so he goes to dismiss the whole thing. What does he do? He changes all their languages. That's why it's called the Tower of Babel or Babel. They started babbling different languages to each other. But then when Pentecost comes, it's the reversal. God comes down from heaven and he comes to build his kingdom and he gives the gifts of tongues so that everyone can understand and be united in what the Lord is doing. And yet now all of a sudden, some 40 years later in Corinth, the tongue has turned back into babbling and misunderstanding and no one can really talk on the Lord in an intelligible manner. The reversal of what it was first given for. And I think that's why in chapter, uh, sorry, in verse 12, he says, so also, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, they really wanted to excel in this thing. He says, seek to excel in building up the church. I may have said this last week, but if you're trying to discover what's my spiritual gift or what, whatever, my suggestion to you based on verse 12 would be this. Seek to excel in building up the church. If that's the motivation of what you're trying to do, I think the gift will reveal itself. The Lord will make himself manifest in the motivation of what you are trying to do. Do we want to have a, a love, a pursue a love? Yes, Paul says. Do we want to desire spiritual gifts? Yep, Paul's happy with that. Should we yearn to work in the gifts? Yes. Why? To excel in building up the church. That's how the gifts are to be used. And so what we really want to do is we want to bring unity. The tongue talking that's happening in Corinth here is making everyone feel fractured and apart, but the gifts should actually be building us together. In verse 12, he moves on and he says, Therefore the person who speaks in a tongue should pray that he can interpret. You know, last week we talked about gifts. We, we, don't, we don't attain them like accolades. And I think this is a really nice thing just here. It just says, hey, do you desire a spiritual gift? You can ask the Father for it. You may not by nature have it. He might not have extended that to you, but you can pray and you can ask for a spiritual gift. But it's up to his discretion, it's up to his will whether or not he chooses to give that over to you.
In 14, for if I pray in the tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So now Paul is talking about himself and he says, look, if I'm praying in a tongue, great, my spirit's moved, but my, my mind's not receiving anything, it's not doing anything. What then? He poses a great question. What, what should I do? Well, I'll tell you what I should do. I will pray with the spirit and I'll also pray with my understanding. And then he talks even further. And when I sing, what will I do? I will sing praise with my spirit and I also sing praise with my understanding. I think here within lies a great debate sometimes that happens in Christian circles. I remember when I first came to faith and I didn't have a vocab to, to actually articulate what I believed to be true in my heart. I wanted to tell people about it, but I couldn't really, I didn't really even understand what I believed fully in Jesus. And it made it really hard. And then when you go to Bible studies, there's that kind of that insecurity, like, I don't know that much. And for someone that grew up in a Christian home, I felt this double shame because I was kind of like in it all, but I hadn't really bothered to learn any of it. And I got a big insecurity. And so when I sat in Bible studies, I felt super unspiritual in comparison to these people who knew way more than what I knew. And then I was like, well, I'll go to college so I can learn how to talk to people, right? So I, so I know how to articulate what it is that I believe. And then you get the degree and then people start turning their noses up at you. Well, Jesus worked with fishermen. I was like, well, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, no joke, I had one guy come up to me and he found out how much time it takes me to write a sermon. <laughs> and he's like, man, you just really lean on your own understanding, don't you? Don't you know the Lord Jesus promises that if you just open your mouth ready to speak, the Holy Spirit, it's scriptural. He'll give you the right words at the right time. So what is it? Do I lean on the spirit or do I use my intellect? Both, says Paul. Oh, praise God in my spirit and oh, praise God with my mind. They're not at opposite ends. You are not more or less spiritual based on how much or how little that you know in comparison to someone else. Do you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for your sins? Great, you have the spirit of God. I'm not more spiritual than you. Jesus said God's worshippers will worship in spirit and truth. It's not about being spiritual and hating, hating truth and intellectual knowledge. And it's not about loving intellectual knowledge and not having the spirit because we know where both of those things go. One is, leads into heretical behaviour and the other one is just a dead doctrine. In verses 16 and 17 we continue, otherwise... If you praise with the Spirit, how will the outsider say amen? So now he brings up another scenario. So let's say you're all in the Spirit, you're all speaking in the tongues, you're doing your thing, you all start worshipping, and then you start giving thanks to God in this tongue, in the Spirit. But he doesn't know what you're saying. How is he going to say amen to that? And then he says in 17, you might very well be giving thanks to God. Yeah, like you might be giving thanks to the Lord in it. But the other person doesn't know what's going on. He's not being built up. I think we all know that feeling of, of, of sometimes sitting in a, in a worship service. And, and something like the music can be so moving in the spirit, right? You're moved. But the lyrics could be so basic that it feels like it's singing a love song about a girl. Or it's something like real vague, like, oh, Lord, you're water and parched land or something like that. I don't know if that's a lyric, I'm just saying. And it can leave you so vague and understand. You're moved in your spirit, but your intellect's receiving nothing. But sometimes it can be the other way around too. You pull out an old hymn, rich in theology, but everyone's sitting there going, to go, you're not moved at all. It's a lot of theological truth going on, but it's dead. It's the same thing with preachers. Get someone real loud, speaking in real deep issues, and you're so moved, but did it really teach you anything about the Lord? Did it really instruct you anything in how to come to Him? 
no, and vice versa, it can work the other way as well. So what do we want? Both. I want to be moved in my spirit like I was this morning and understand what the Lord's done for me. I want to be moved in the preaching and I want my mind to be filled with the things of Christ. Verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. There's a brag. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding in order to teach others also than to speak 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, Paul's not really bragging there. It just sounds like one. But what he's really saying there is he's like, look, guys, I exercise this gift and I surpass you in being able to exercise it. Paul, again, we know is bilingual and can preach the gospel in many languages. On top of it, he's talking about a prayer life that he has with the Lord. And he says, I can do this greater than you, but guess what, church? I'd refrain from using it. Even though I have it in surplus, I refrain from using it so that I can be for the betterment of others. You see, it's not his gift to be done how he feels. And he'd rather speak just a few words if it brings people further along in their faith than to speak all the words in the tongues and it just be void. <clears throat> and Paul says in 20, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your thinking. Be infants in regards to evil and adult in your way of thinking. You know, Jess, at the moment, my wife, she can't go grocery shopping with my four-year-old girl because she just tucks, chucks a tantrum every single time. And, and little children have no regard for how they affect others. <laughs> it's childish behavior. They sit there and they fall on the floor and they're screaming and yelling. You're all embarrassed for them. Everyone else is looking around like you're the worst parent in the world. And... And they don't care. They're so self-centered, they don't care about anything else. And you're saying, don't be childish in your thinking in regards to the spiritual gifts. Think about how you're using them. You know, because when we grow up, when we become adult, most of us, I think, you start to think about how your actions and how your words affect other people. Hopefully, we become less self-centered. And this is the basic concept Paul is giving with your spiritual gifts. A mature person in Christ considers when their gift is most appropriate, when it's going to build up. Our gift in worship should bring clarity to the Lord, not just to do whatever we feel like. <clears throat> and he moves on in verse 21 <clears throat> and says, It is written in the law, I'll speak to this people by people of other tongues. And by the lips of foreigners, and even then, they will not listen to me. That, that prophetic word comes from Isaiah 28. And just to give you the broad overview, what was happening was pretty much all the leaders of the Israel nation up in the northern kingdom of Samaria, you got the, the king, the prophet, and the priest, the big three that kind of led the people. And the big three are all getting drunk <clears throat> to the point of vomiting at night and they're kind of half learning God's word and they're, they're, it says in the prophetic word that they're stammering over their speech as they try to teach these little kids the word of God and the Lord condemns them in it because they're not treating, well they're treating with contempt the word of God and he says because of this the Assyrians <clears throat> will come from the north and they will take you and the sign to my people that you did not listen to my word, that you did not listen to Isaiah will be this. When you hear the foreign tongue of the Assyrians, you will know that you did not listen to my voice. It was a sign to them. The sign of the Assyrians speaking in foreign language would be the sign that they did not adhere to and listen to the Lord. And he's saying that because in 22, speaking in tongues in foreign languages then, is intended as a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. We don't need to speak in foreign language to each other. It's made as a sign for the unbeliever. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for believers. Who did the prophets go to? To God's people. To speak intelligibly of who God is, what he has commanded, 
and what they are supposed to do in light of that. <clears throat> it's interesting too, if you look through the book of Acts and you come to say where Peter is and he has the vision of not eating, uh, you know, eating unclean food and he doesn't actually understand the imagery and then all of a sudden he has to go to a centurion's house to, to share the gospel. And as he's sharing the gospel at this Gentile home that is unclean, all of a sudden, the centurion and the whole family start talking in tongues. Now, Peter doesn't understand what's, what's going on as far as the verbal communication, but it serves as a sign to him that he must believe that salvation is now extended to the Gentiles. That salvation is not just for God's people, the Jews, but it goes all the way to the ends of the earth and even the Gentile people can come in unto it. It was a sign for him. And the nature of signs is people will believe and they won't believe. <clears throat> Pentecost... A lot of people heard the tongue talking and a lot of them came back with the idea that everyone's drunk. They rebuked the idea that the tongue was anything. But for those who wanted to believe or come into that, heard their voice or heard their language and came into it. Jesus himself had this kind of issue. He would sit there and do miracles and signs and wonders all the time and people would want to test him again and again and again. He feeds the 5,000 and they come back to him and they're like, give us a sign in heaven so that we can know you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, you corrupt and unbelieving generation, no sign will be given to you except that of Jonah in the belly of the whale. So he didn't give him a sign, what he gave him was a prophetic word. Jonah in the belly is the prophetic word that I will be in the ground three days and I will rise again. That's your sign. He gave them prophecy. Prophecy. So when he says in verse 23, which sounds contradictory, if therefore the whole church, so let's say in this church, we all gather together and assemble and all of us start speaking in tongues and no one can understand anyone, but everyone's talking to God and people who are outsiders or unbelievers come in, maybe visitors, or Christian visitors or an unbeliever who doesn't know the faith, will they not say then you're out of your minds? Because you'd sit there and think, well, if an unbeliever came in and heard the tongues, isn't that a sign that they know? But he says, no, they will look at you and they'll think you're crazy. <clears throat> and then he brings up the second point in 24. He says, but if all of you are prophesying, you're speaking intelligibly so that people can understand, and an unbeliever, an outsider comes in, he is convicted by all and is called to all, to, to account by all. So this is another situation. He goes, well, let's look at the different values. If I speak in tongues and we all start speaking in tongues, spiritual though it might be, it doesn't help anyone. But if we all were in here prophesying, communicating intelligibly what the Lord has done in the Spirit, well, now not only is the church being built up, but unbelievers are coming to a salvation. And look at the effect of prophetic word. The secrets of his heart will be revealed and as a result he will fall face down and worship God proclaiming God is really among you. You have to hold that intention with it encourages, it strengthens and it consoles. Conviction is an encouragement to us. When the Lord Almighty reveals the things of our hearts it's an encouragement to go to him. In 2 Corinthians, I think it's 1, 7, it says that there's worldly guilt which leads you away from the Lord. That's a, that's, a, that's a gross conviction. We don't want that kind of conviction. If you get a conviction of sin, of something that you're doing or something you have done and it makes you want to run away from God, that's not the Lord. It says that when the Lord brings conviction, when the Holy Spirit brings conviction, it brings you to the Lord. Why? Because you know that God's forgiving. Because you know that he's loving, that he's kind to sinners. And you can come to him with all that you are, and he will forgive you. As we saw last week, what is that that the Holy Spirit wants to convict us in? Of sin, of judgment, and righteousness. Yes, we are sinners in need of forgiveness and salvation. Yes, there is a judgment. God will bring justice to the evil done in this world but he will also bring righteousness and that he will clothe us in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. 
I, I got to, I think one of the beautiful things of, of pastoring is you get to speak to a lot of the people in the congregation. <clears throat> and I got to, she got to hear a story this week of someone who said that they, they received a word from the Lord. It's just a word. And they got to speak to someone on the beach. And as they brought this word up to this person, and it had nothing to do with Christ at all, but as that got communicated, all of a sudden the flow-out effect was they got to share another prophetic word, the scriptural prophetic word, that there is a God that loves them, that cares for them, that will forgive them if they come to Jesus Christ. So if you want to look at prophetic word as something for here and now, the prophetic word as, as scripture reinterpreted or whatever, I don't mind, what have you, there is real power in prophetic and tongue talking. But in the prophetic, not only is the church built, but you are able to reveal the revelation of Jesus Christ. Would this church, CHBC, be a place where the prophetic word of the gospel that people who do not know about the salvation that is brought to them, the love that is there, that Christ is in their midst, that the living God, as Jeff so well put out this morning, is here among us. That he is touching the hearts and the lives of people who do not know him. There's been one other funny thing, I'm not going to talk too much on this, is I feel like Theology is one thing, believing in it is quite another. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I can preach on this, I can teach this from the logistical point. Uh, but the Lord actually came to me through someone again as well and uh, spoke prophetically to me. And the reason I could tell that it was prophetic was because they told me something that no one else knows about me. It absolutely shocked me, to be honest with you. But as I said this morning to someone, I felt like the Lord had gotten a highlighter and just put a highlighter over my name. And that's the power of a real, living, personal God who cares for his people. And oh, how he cares for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you increase our faith all the more? Increase our faith to be bold, to step out for you. Increase us in faith that we might, as you desire, increase in us the spiritual gifting so that we will build the kingdom with you, hand in hand. Lord, bless us, I pray. Help us to excel from a motivation of love for one another to excel in a place where we want to build the kingdom with our Father, to work in the field with Him. That it might be a blessing to others and it might bring others into the kingdom who can fall down in worship and say, the Lord is really among you. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.